want to thank um, I want to thank Lindsay and Richard. The song was absolutely beautiful. Isn't it good to know that Jesus chose us? Um, isn't it good to know that Jesus chose us? Yeah. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Now, I know that um, we're still getting to know each other, but when I say Happy Sabbath, you say Happy Day. Happy Sabbath. Happy Day. Happy Sabbath. Now, when I say happy day, you say happy Sabbath. Happy day. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. All right, all right, all right, all right. Um, if you love the Lord this morning, come on, put your hands together. You know, um, the words to that song says, why should I be content, merely content with just being alive? Um, yeah, I could live without you. But John 10.10 10 tells us that I came that you might have life and you might have life more abundantly. Um, again, I want to thank my pastors, Pastor Cross, who extended the invitation, and Pastor um, Eddie Tupai. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know where his toupee went, but <laughs> Tupai, all right. Uh, uh, he has truly been gracious, and he has been, uh, he and his wife have been wonderful, Luther and Zebedee and Micah and Wesley have been wonderful also. I want to acknowledge the work that's been done here for this camp meeting. Um, in terms of the backdrop, would you give the young adult who did this a hand clap, everybody? That'll make her feel good. And again, um, praise team, Sam and everyone else. I don't know all of your names, Richard and um, Dion and Jay and I know most of them. I know quite a few. You're doing a wonderful job. Praise God for you. Wouldn't you all like to see our band continue during the week, everybody? Say amen. amen. Yeah, that's right. I'd like to see them intact um, during the week. Also, uh, I bring you, I said I bring you greetings on behalf of Southern California Conference on last night. Um, in particular, I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Lorenzo Grant, who's my immediate supervisor, my, my director. Uh, he sends his greetings. He uh, is the director for our region, and he is truly supportive of us being here, right? And so we appreciate his support while we're here doing God's work. Take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 15. How many of you, first of all, how many of you have your Bibles? Hold them up. Come on, hold them up high. No, 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 never mind. If you have your Bible, stand up. Stand up. You got your Bible. Stand up. Be proud. Say it loud. I got my Bible and I'm proud. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. How many of you um, got your Bible in your heart? Raise your hand. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. All right. You know, my wife and I talking about having a Bible in your heart. My wife and I experienced something funny on last week. Uh, last Sabbath at our home church, it was communion Sabbath. And young lady at the end of communion service as the custom at this church is they give testimonies at the end of the church service and everybody was giving their testimony so this one young young lady stood up and said my favorite verse of the bible says my favorite verse her favorite verse now says for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life isn't that John 3.16? And everybody fell out laughing. Now, she said she had her Bible in her heart. That's supposed to be her favorite verse. Shouldn't you know your favorite verse by heart? Well, I hope and pray that you know the Bible. So don't be like that young lady saying that's your favorite verse and you don't know where it's at anyway. Um, 
Acts 15, everybody. Acts 15. Uh, we're going to look at verses 36 through 41. If you got paper and pen, I want you to take it out. We're going to go to school. Oh, I want to thank the educators, the teachers. Uh, aren't you all teachers? What's the name of the Adventist Academy here, right? Am I right? Okay. All right. Thank you again. Acts 15. When you have it, let me hear you say amen. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, men, I just want you to fake it. If you got Acts 15 in your heart, let me hear you say amen. Men. Where are all the men? Raise your hand. If you're a man, raise your hand. If you're a male, raise your hand. All right, well, the women, sisters, if you have Acts chapter 15, let me hear you say amen. amen. Oh, fellas. <laughs> fellas, we're going to have to work on that, fellas. We, you know, we, we be getting, okay, fellas, we're we going to talk a little bit later. Uh, Acts chapter 15. And it reads like this. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And it reads in verse 39. Hold on, let me have a man. Let me have a man, man. A brother, read verse 39 for me. Let me have a man. Read verse 39. Stand up and read with a strong voice, man. Where are you? Any man. All right, go, brother. Verse 39. Thank you, brother. Now, let me have a sister with a strong voice and not afraid of the gospel. Let me hear you read verse 40. Amen. And together, everybody, all of us read verse 41. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. This morning, the sermon is entitled, Giving Up on People Too Soon. Giving Up on People Too Soon. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer one more time. Let's bow our heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for who you are and for this camp meeting. We praise you, O oh Lord, for choosing us. We praise you, my Father, for being gracious. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I like the Bible. The Bible is one of my favorite books. And one of the reasons the Bible is one of my favorite books, if not my, well, it is my favorite book, but one of the reasons that it is my favorite book is because the Bible is not politically correct. See, that's what I'm talking about. I don't know what that is. The Bible is politically incorrect. See, the Bible doesn't care. The Bible does not care whether you are rich or poor, famous, insignificant, the Bible don't give two cents about your pedigree. The Bible is not impressed with how long you've been an Adventist or how many generations of Adventists you've been. The Bible does not really recognize any of that. The Bible is the kind of book that um, just tells it like it is. It's the kind of book that paints a picture just the way it is. I like the Bible because like any photographer, like any artist, and in my world, photography, the Bible will capture a scene. It will capture the look of an eye. 
It will capture disappointment and it will highlight um, frustration. The Bible will give you the nitty gritty. It will give you the ins and outs of the ins and outs. The Bible is not a book that's about being politically correct. Nor is the Bible a book about why. You see, so much of our world today is consumed with wanting to know why. Why do good people suffer? Why do the rich become, uh, why do the evil become rich? The Bible may, it may, it, there may be people that may bring that up, but that's not the, the crux of the Bible. The Bible, as one, one writer, as one preacher says, the Bible is more of a how book. The Bible is not about why, why do, why, why didn't this happen or why didn't that happen or why does this happen and why, 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 why? The Bible is all about how. The Bible is all about how God intercepted history. The Bible is all about how God, uh, 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 he, he, he retarded growth of sin. The Bible is about how God intervenes in the lives of young men and young ladies. The Bible is not about trying to find out why as much. Because you see, there's a, prep, there's a proposition, there's a presupposition, I'm sorry, a presupposition that underscores the Bible. And the presupposition that underscores the Bible is that the Bible assumes that God is omnipotent. The Bible assumes and presumes that God is omnipresent and he's omniscient and that God has whatever it takes to solve, whatever the situation may be. The Bible presumes that. And so the Bible writers don't get caught up so much into why. See, the Bible writers presume that God has power. See, why is more of a question of powerlessness. Well, one of the things you need to know is that in Acts chapter 15, the Bible paints a picture for us. Now, take your Bibles and look at Acts 15 one more time. Now, everything we're going to do is going to come out of this verse and one other verse. Acts 15, it says, it says, And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where, they, where we have preached the word of the Lord. And see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Now, one of the things you need to know, hold on. Okay, all right. We hot? Okay. One of the things you need to know is that, again, the Bible is not concerned about being politically correct. I believe that if more of our churches were concerned about what's really going on, they would be more full than they are. Somebody say amen. A lot of times our churches are all about information, information, information. Get baptized because the Lord is coming again. And yes, he is. And yes, we ought to preach the, seven, the, uh, the, the, the Seventh-day Adventist message. And yes, we ought to preach the Sabbath. And we ought to preach the Second Coming. Yes, we ought to do those things. Yes, we must do those things. Yes, that's why I exist because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist minister. But I kid you not, brothers and sisters, when I look around and I see what's happening in a lot of our churches, yeah, it's easy to say that people are being shaken and anything that can be shaken will be shaken. But I believe that we have to take into account the fact that there are a lot of needs that are not being met. Somebody say hello. Oh, come on. Somebody say hello. There are a lot of needs that are not being met. We'll come to that later. But here in Acts 15, we have the situation where John Mark has failed. And not only has he failed, He's failed miserably. Anybody here ever got an F minus? Anybody here ever got not just an F, you know, where 50%, you know, is an F? 
or 45, but you know, you got like a 21% on your grade. You got like a 19. Well, I've done that before, and I know what that's like to fail and fail miserably. I don't mean where you fail and you just a couple of more points and you might get a D. I mean a failure to the point that there's no hope. Call an ambulance and take them to the hospital because it's over. Well, John Mark failed. The Bible says he failed miserably. And the Bible takes this snapshot and it shows us, you all, it shows us that in the work of God, there is failure. And while we do God's will, we will experience failure. We will experience things that will hurt us. And we will experience things that will hinder our growth. We will experience things that will make us wonder, are we doing the right thing? We will come into situations and deal with people and, and loved ones that may betray us. And we wonder, am I in the right path? Am I going the right way? Is this, you know? The people that I looked up to are no longer with us. What, what, what's going on? John Mark failed. Now, here's some of the things that you may need to know. Number one, John Mark had a lot to live up to. A lot to live up to. You see, John Mark's uncle was Barnabas. When you do biblical research, you do historical studies, you understand that he had a whole lot of family pressure riding on him. Anybody here know what that's like? To have your father and your mother and your grandfather and your family depending on you. You cannot bring shame to our family. Well, John Mark had pressure riding on him. Maybe, maybe John Mark did not know. And the Bible and, and historic history tells us that John Mark was around 17 to 18, maybe 19 years of age. That late high school early college, university age. They said, the Bible tells us that he failed. And this young man was in this situation where he's got to deal with one of the most radical zealots to ever walk the face of the earth. Paul was absolutely a kamikaze Christian. Paul was out of his mind. And John Mark, 17 years of age, got caught up with a crazy man. A man who did not mind being beaten with the cat of nine tails on five different occasions. Do you know what the cat of nine tails are? Cat, hey, let me tell you. That's where they take rock, stone, sharp bones, and, and glass, and they mold it all together, bounded by leather straps. And those leather straps are tethered and everything's tethered together and what they do is the person who's getting beat will have to stretch their backs out and expose their backs not with clothes on but bare backs and they began to whip that person with those objects and the cat and nine tails would rip into the back of the person and pull the skin apart and cause canal little canals of blood to come gushing forth until the person was nothing but a bloody mess. Well, Paul went through that five times. And John Mark got hooked up with him. Now, when you're 17 or 18 years of age, you don't know what, you, you, you know, you think you know, but you don't know. How many of y'all have 17-year-old brothers and sisters or cousins or nephews who think they know everything? They can't be told anything. They're hard-headed. They believe they got all of the answers and they believe that what happened to you will not happen to them. They won't learn from your example, but they hear you and they say, oh, you're nothing but an old fool. But they don't know that there's pain waiting for them. Uh-huh. 17. Everybody say 17. John Mark was 17 or 18 years of age. And he got hooked up with a man by the name of Paul who was just out of his mind. So, number one, John Mark had pressure, family pressure, Secondly, John Mark, you all, um, got caught up with a man who just did not have, who just did not have no fear. Here's a third item. Maybe John Mark failed on the first missionary trip with Paul because there were too many mosquitoes. Oh, yeah. Some parts of the world are filled with mosquitoes. Some of you who've been to the Solomon Islands and some of you 
who've been to other parts of the world will know that there are places and times of the year where there are like mosquitoes are like clouds in the sky. And one bite could mean malaria, two bites could mean death. It could One bite could mean death. It could mean anything. And maybe John Mark just wasn't prepared for what he was about to deal with. But for whatever the reason, the Bible says in Acts 15 that he failed. And not only did he fail, but he fell miserably. He fell so badly until Paul did not want to give him a second chance. And here is something that we're dealing with today in our society today. The Bible says that there was contention between Paul and Barnabas. And the contention, the fighting, and the arguing was about potential. John Mark was the object. Now imagine, John Mark is in the middle. You've got Paul against him, and you've got Barnabas for him. And you've got Paul saying, I don't want to give this young buck another chance because I can't trust him. And Barnabas saying, Paul, he made his mistakes, but we ought to give him another chance. We ought to give him another shot. We ought to give him another opportunity. And Paul saying, no, man, the work is too important. We can't trust the work to babies. We can't trust the work to mama's boys and to little girly men. We can't give the work to those kind of guys. He's a sissy and we don't need him. And Barnabas says, but Paul, this young man has potential. Let's nurture the potential and let's guide the potential and let's, let's encourage the potential and let's give him another chance. But not only that, this is my nephew. And I'm going to stand up for him, even though he did let us down the first time. Now, brothers and sisters, don't you know that of all people, Paul, write this down, of all people, Paul should have been the first person in line to give somebody a second chance. Paul, who who persecuted the Christians. Paul, who who killed innocent children, who, who broke up homes and who destroyed towns. Paul, the one who Jesus had to knock off of a horse in order to get his attention. Paul should have been the one to give John Mark a second chance. Paul should have been the one to say, John Mark, you know what? I understand where you're coming from. I understand that things didn't work out. But but look, man, I'll give you another chance and you can go with us. But no, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that Paul said no and Barnabas said yes. And the Bible says that the contention and the word there is, the argument became so high. Until they had to part, they had to leave, they had to go turn their backs on each other and go in separate ways. This morning, I want to ask you something. Do you have churches that have given up on young people? Do you have churches that have given up on young adults? What about you yourself? Have you given up on somebody because they let you down or they disappointed you or they didn't come through or they or, uh, 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 something went wrong in the relationship? But since we're talking as a church, What's going on with our churches? When churches are giving up and writing people off. Hmm. You know what? I hope y'all don't mind if this preach is politically incorrect. But I want to ask you something. If it were not for the grace of God, would half the older people in your church be there still? Would you still be in your church if not for the grace of God? I had a man, I had an experience with a man one time. His name was Brother Nathaniel Diggs. Brother Nathaniel Diggs was a construction worker. He was a heavy machine operator, and he did all, he did, he did, he did between both. So this one summer, uh, he was trained in both areas. And so this one summer, about the age of 17, I, 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 I was looking to make, make money. I needed to work for the summer. And, and down home in Louisiana, the, you know, the summer temperatures can be about 105 degrees, and the humidity can be well over 90, 95%. And, and so this one summer, my mother said, if you want to make it and if you want to do something great, Pollard, I want you to, to go out there and earn some money. And I want you to work with Brother Nathaniel Diggs. I said, oh, okay, no problem. I was in high school. I was on the football team. I was working out with the weights. You know, I was pushing up the weights and doing my thing. And I was, you know, running my miles and running up the stadium stairs. I was a pretty good athlete. I figured construction work couldn't do nothing to me. I was the man. Construction work can't do. I'm, I'm the, look, I'm the man. So I go out there about 
6 o'clock in the morning. I go out there to the site. I said, Brother Diggs, I'm here to work. I want you to know that I'm here to do, 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 do hard work. I want to get paid. He said, how much do I get paid, Brother Diggs? He said, oh, well, Ron, look, you'll make about, at that time, which was good money, he said, you make about $10 an hour. I said, okay, cool. I can live with that. That's good money. I can make that. And man, look, Brother Diggs, I'm a good worker. You won't find anybody better and more faithful than I am. He said, talk is cheap. Let's see what you got. I said, Brother Diggs, man, look, look, man, look, I'm the man. He said, okay, I want you to grab that bag of semen over there. I said, what, that bag of semen over there? He said, yeah. I said, that bag says it weighs about 25 pounds. He said, I want you to grab that bag of semen. I said, Brother Diggs, I'll grab that bag of semen. Anything else you want me to do? So I grabbed the bag of semen. He said, oh, okay, so pour it in here. I started pouring the semen. And I was feeling good about myself, family. I was feeling good. I was feeling really good about myself. And then all of a sudden, I, 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 he said to me, hold on. He said, you know, you're not done. I said, okay, I got the bag of semen. I'm pouring it in. I said, what's going on? He said, I got a truck coming with about 15 or 20 more bags of semen that I want you to pull and pour. I said, each one of those bags weigh 20 pounds? He said, yeah. I said, no problem, Brother Diggs. I got this. No problem, man. I'm the man. I got this, Brother Diggs. Now, you know 17, you're talking trash. You're feeling good about yourself. You think you're the man. You know you. And so I said, Brother Diggs, I got this. So I said, Brother Diggs, I went and got the second bag of trash. Lift with your legs, not with your back. Lift with your legs, not with your back. I went and got that. I poured that bag of cement. Went and got another bag of cement. Oh, I'm feeling good now. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling, ah. Oh, yeah, I'm, ah. Feeling, ugh. Got through that bag, those 20 bags of cement. The dig said, oh, man, that's good. You're a good worker, man. Good, 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 good. The truck, the second truck is coming around with 20 more bags of cement. Ah. <sighs> so at this point, he says, you, how you feeling? I said, I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm not bragging anymore, you see. So I go back. I said, okay. Ah, oh, yeah. Getting the cement. I go through the second bag. I mean, go through my second set of bags. Ah. And by the way, y'all, let me tell you, from 6 o'clock, it's now only 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm saying, after I got done with that second truck of bags of cement, I was like, okay, Brother Diggs, we take a break, right? Ah, we take a break, don't we, Brother Diggs? He said, Ronald, we just getting started. I said, Brother Diggs, what are you talking about we just getting started? He said, man, look, these men have been working out here for, for these men have been out here. You, first of all, you came out here late. I said, what do you mean? He said, we've been here since 4 a.m. I said, oh, okay. He said, so you got to put your full eight hours in. Then he said to me, now, here's what I want you to do. I have another bag of cement coming. I said, man, you crazy. I said, Brother Diggs, you mean another bag, another truck with how many bags? He said, oh, this, this is the last shipment for the day. I said, well, how many bags, Brother Diggs? He said, you won't have to lift anymore after this. Brother Diggs, how many bags? He said, look, man, don't worry about that. It's the last shipment of cement bags for the whole day. Brother Diggs, how many bags? Please tell me how many bags. He said, oh, no, just, just, just 25, 30 bags of cement. I said, and I'm supposed to lift those other 25 or 30 bags? He said, yeah, man. Heart, you, you know. So I said, Brother Diggs, I said, you crazy. I said, look, man, I want my mama and I want her now. <laughs> he said to me, he said, look, boy, he said, don't embarrass me. I've been bragging to all of these men out here. I've been telling these men. Uh, you, you, but Ronald's a good worker. He's a strong worker. Ronald's got it together. He's in good shape. And these men are watching to see if you're going to be, if you're going to do what you said you're going to do. And if my word is good. He said, Ronald, don't embarrass me. This is my crew. I'm the foreman of this crew. I said, Brother Diggs, I ain't thinking about your embarrassment, Brother Diggs. I'm thinking about my back. I got a long way to go, Brother Diggs. I'm only 17. I got to keep living. You done lived. You old. You about to die. You can go on. So I, I, I did about 10 more bags of cement. And then I went on. He had me do some other things. But sometimes, but what, one of the things that happened was Brother Dig said to me, you know what? He said, I'm glad you got through that extra bag of 10. He said, because most guys, Ronald, have problems doing as much as you did. I said, well, Brother Diggs, I hope I didn't fail you. He said, well, look. I want you to know something. I'm not going to give up on you. 
I want you to come back tomorrow and do the same thing. Now, that was Brother Diggs helping me, Nathaniel Diggs helping me. How many of our young people need to know that there's somebody who believes in them when they mess up their lives? How many of us need to know that somebody believes in us, somebody is choosing to love us and to pray for us when our lives are being turned upside down and when we're making the wrong decisions? Hey, how is it, how easy is it to, to give up on somebody who marries someone you told them not to marry? Oh, y'all mighty quiet in here. Anybody know anybody like that? Raise your hand. Yeah, y'all know people like that. Somebody who mismarried. Now, I believe in marriage, but I've had many people that I, as a pastor, one of the things I do, Richard, is I counsel. I do a lot of counseling. I do a lot of premarital and marital counseling. And one of the things I do is I'm very honest with couples before they get married. And I say, with, I say to them, look, you all are really not ready for marriage at this point. We go through the personality testing. We pray together. We spend time talking. We go through all of the, all of the steps that are needed for premarital counseling. Uh, we do all of those things. And, and, and at the end of that, we, we do about five or six months or seven months of premarital counseling two or three times a week. It's very intense. And, 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 and we're getting them ready for marriage. Because everybody wants to get married for the first three months. Everybody likes the first three or four months. But do you have what it takes to make it the next four, five, six, seven, eight, ten years? Well, a lot of people are not prepared for what life has to offer. And in Acts 15, we discover that John Mark really wasn't prepared for what life had to offer. You see, he did not know that life had a pole to offer him. He did not know that this great man of the gospel who he believed in and who he looked up to would be the kind of person that would give out and give up on him. He did not know that this kind of person is the kind of person who had little patience with people who didn't rise to the standard. How many of our churches have certain standards and we have certain standards? As soon as somebody eats cheese, we say that they're going to hell. How many times have you heard it said that if you eat, if you drink 30 minutes after you eat, oh, that's not, oh, 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 how could you? You drink and ate at the same, oh, and salvation has become a thing of works. And the very people who are accusing you or who are putting you down because of some mistake that you may make, don't, they fail to see that there's a big old tree in their eye. They're pointing at the little splinter in your life and there's a big old tree sticking out of their eye and yet they feel as if they're in position to criticize, condemn, and prosecute. I know. You got to understand something. That salvation is a gift of God. Somebody say amen. You cannot work your way into Jesus Christ. You cannot work your way into salvation. You cannot work your way. You can't run enough stairs. You can't eat enough veggie mite. You can't eat enough veggie loaf. You can't eat enough soy, whatever, to make it into the kingdom of God. You make it into the kingdom of God because of his grace and his mercy. You don't make it into the kingdom of God because you've been vegetarian 10 years and I'm still struggling to be a vegetarian. I am, but I'm just saying you as an example. My point is that I serve the Lord out of love. Everything that I do is out of love. Everything that I do, everything that I am is out of love. So therefore, who was Paul to say to John Mark that he could not engage in the work of God again? If anybody should have been disqualified permanently, it should have been Paul. John Mark, you never read of John Mark killing people. Somebody say amen. Throughout the Bible, you never read of John Mark slaughtering families. But Paul slaughtered families. Paul killed people. Paul was there when Stephen was stoned. Paul was there when Stephen saw the Lord Jesus in heaven. It was Paul who was holding the coat as they stoned the, the, the deacon Stephen. It was Paul. And then Paul took the like behavior and prosecuted the saints and persecuted the saints. But of all people, he should have been the one to never, ever give up on anybody. 
Now, this camp meeting, we're talking about being chosen. I want you to understand something. We've got to become the living embodiments of what it means to be chosen. We've got to be examples to these young people who are running around this campground still looking to see how many girls they can get. We've got to be the example for the young men, for the young ladies around here who are still wondering if they're cute or pretty enough or if they're good enough or whatever. They, we've got to help them understand and help them see that God created you, baby, just the way he liked you. God created you, honey, the way he likes you. He thinks you're beautiful just like you are. You don't have to do something to trick your body and trick your face up and, and, and fix yourself. And Baby, you're beautiful. God created you that way, and, and we've got to help them understand that and be confident where they are. God doesn't give up on anybody. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy. What book of the Bible did I say, everybody? Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, I know y'all are hot. I know you're hot. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, in Acts 15, we have contention. We have arguments. We have disagreement. We have a fight. We have, we have, we have the Bible showing us that it's not concerned about being politically correct. Watch me, watch me, watch me. We have the Bible showing us that it's not about being politically correct. The Bible is a book that tells it just like it is. The Bible says to us in Acts 15 that even people of God have issues, that even people of God have problems, that people of God come into conflict, the people of God who love God have disagreement, the people of God who serve God, they will have problems with one another. Personalities may not get along, but the work of God has to continue. Amen? Now watch them, watch. In Acts 15, the Bible shows us that these two great men of God who love the Lord and who are powerful spiritual men have issues and they have their own set of beliefs and they have their own style and they have their own preferences and yet they're still the people of God. So the Bible lets us know that even in the work of God, we have the opportunity to be different and still do the work of God. We have the opportunity to be distinct and still promote the gospel. Everybody's not going to be the same. Everybody's not going to talk the same. And one of the things I say to couples all the time, and one of the things that the marriage studies, the marital studies, and the, the family studies have done is, you know, when you have, have you ever met a couple or, or, or somebody, they really like somebody, and, and they always agree with them? But what do you think? Oh, whatever you think. Well, dear, how do you feel? Well, I feel the way you feel. Well, honey, how do you feel? Well, honey, you know, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you, baby. Well, my Lord, my Lord, one of the things we've learned in, in marital studies and in family studies is if you're always agreeing with each other, then write this down, write this down. If you're always agreeing with each other, somebody's irrelevant. Somebody is irrelevant. I'm not trying to get into family life discussion here this morning as much as trying to point out to you that sometimes disagreement makes you sharper. Sometimes a difference of opinion helps you to grow. Sometimes a difference point of view helps you dig a little deeper to understand where you ought to come from and what you ought to do. Sometimes disagreeing or seeing things a little differently helps you to do more research. And if we need anything today in our churches here in New Zealand, we need people who do more research. Somebody say amen. Need more, y'all talk to me. We need research. And that's all right to disagree. Some may say tomato, I say tomato. But it's all right. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, I want you to look at verse 11. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11. It reads like this. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark. Read it with me, everybody. Take Mark. Come on, everybody, read it with me. Take Mark and bring what? Four. Oh, come on now. Let's read this again. It says here, only Luke is with me. Now, everybody, read the rest of it. Four. To me for the ministry. The same young man that Paul said in Acts 15 doesn't deserve a second chance is the same young man that he's asking for 
just before he dies. In 2 Timothy, the same young man that he says should not go on the missionary tour is the same young man that he wants to come back with him now. He says, only Luke is with me. And when you read above that, look, 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 look. It says, it says right here, it says, in, 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 in 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says right here, it says, Demas hath for, in verse 10, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Paul said, Demas left me because he loved this present world. Then he says, only Luke is with me. And by the way, as you know, Luke was not a disciple of Christ. He was a disciple of Paul. Luke, he says, only person with me is Luke. Bring John Mark with you. He's profitable for the ministry. Now, my question to you is this. What happened between Acts 15 and 2 Timothy chapter 4? What happened between Acts 15 and 2 Timothy chapter 4? I believe that one of the things that happened is that somewhere along the line, two things happened. Somewhere along the line, John Mark matured and Paul matured. Somewhere along the line, John Mark, the younger person, matured. And Paul, the older person, matured. Oh, just because you're older doesn't mean you don't stop, that you stop growing. Somebody say amen. If you stop growing, then that means that you stop learning. And if you stop learning, that means that you stop obeying. And if you stop obeying, that means you stop following. And if you stop following, that means you're not a lover and a follower of Christ. And no man cometh unto the Father except by me, Jesus said. So you've got to follow Christ. So somewhere along the line, Paul matured and John Mark matured. And in his last hours, just before he was about to die, while he was incarcerated, Paul says, bring the young man with me that I gave up on in Acts 15. And him. For those of you sitting out there this morning, you may have traveled a long way to hear this, but you need to know there's room for recovery. You need to know there's room for recovery. You need to understand that there's a time for you to get back in right relationship with God. There's a time for you to recover. God does not give up on anybody too soon. And too many times we give up on people. And we have an example there in Acts 15 and in 2 Timothy 4 where Paul realized that he made a mistake. He gave up on this young man and he cut him off and he wrote him off when he should have said, you know what? Let me give this young man another chance. Let me give him another shot. Let me give him another try. And that's what I like about the Bible. The Bible shows us that David can make mistakes. The Bible shows us that Solomon can make mistakes. The Bible highlights the fact that Paul made a mistake. You know, let me tell you something. It's not easy being a Christian today. When we first got here, we were in our hotel, the Rayland Motel, Rayland Motel, Rayland Motel, Rayland or Rayland? Rayland Motel. And I was just flipping through the channels. And there was this girl on there singing this song, uh, Shut Up, Shut Up, Shut Up. <laughs> I don't know her name. But I felt like saying, won't you shut up? Won't you just shut up? I mean, you ain't saying nothing. I mean, you know, a lot of attitude. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Shut up, shut up. A lot of attitude, but not really saying anything. Just a bunch of attitude. And then there was this song with Christina Aguilera that came on later. Now, y'all need to know for those of you who are Pharisaical out there who are judging me right now, I was just flipping the channels, all right? <laughs> I was just flipping the channels, just seeing, getting used to New Zealand TV. That's all, seeing what's here in New Zealand. Same foolishness here as back home in the States. All right, same stuff, all right, same stuff. And so... And so I was like, you know, my, I looked at my wife. I said, can you believe that our, we have young people who are running after this stuff? We have young people who are living for this stuff. We have young adults who live to go partying, who live to go to the clubs, that they can't wait until they can put on something that's so tight that their blood doesn't course through their veins. Or the brothers, you know, they, they, they just 
you know, thug life everywhere. Brothers just want to look hard, just want to be hard and everywhere. And, 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 and it's amazing. You see, we have young people and young adults today, church family, that are very, very much caught up into the things of the world. And that's why I always try to encourage churches, enjoy praise and worship. Have a good time singing the songs of Zion. Have a wonderful time with Brother Sam and him clapping your hands and enjoying yourself. Why? I'm going to enjoy myself in church because I don't go to the world and enjoy it. Oh, y'all didn't hear me? Oh, do y'all hear me? It's okay, young people, to come to church and enjoy your church. It's all right to come and enjoy Sabbath school. Now, make sure you study so you can get more out of it and get more to it. But enjoy church. Enjoy service. Learn how to enjoy yourself. God has not given up on you. See, some people think that, oops, I said a cuss word. Oops. I'm, now, I'm not going to be politically correct. I'm going to tell you the truth. Some of you all are going to cuss tonight. Now, I'm not saying I want you to. I know some of you will. There's somebody somewhere around this tent who's going to, something's going to fall on their feet. And they go, oh, God. There's somebody somewhere around in this campground. And they shouldn't, but it may happen. Does that mean that you don't have an access to God? No, you have access to God. God has made a way for you and he has not given up on you. I don't care how miserable the failure is. God loves you. And in Acts 15, we have this situation where, where, where Paul gave up on this young man because he got tired. You know, sometimes young men can't keep up with older men. No matter how brave they think they are, no matter how smart they think they are, no matter how fast they may think they can run. I had a young man a few days, well, a few months ago, come to my house, spent the weekend with me. So I said, hey, man, you want to go with me to the health club? I'm going to go to the health club and I'm just going to go and, you know, just work out and things of that nature. And I, and it would be good to have a partner. My wife said, yeah, take him with you, honey. Y'all go ahead on and, and bond and, and do that male bonding thing and have a good time together, right? So we went to the health club. He said, oh, Pastor Polly, you're an old man. He said, you're an old man, Pastor. He went on and on and on. You old, Pastor. See, back in your day, in the old school time, Pastor, you old, man. You old, Pastor. You look, you rickety. You know, you're rusty. He was talking about me bad, y'all. And I just smiled. I was trying to be Christian. I was trying to be Christian. I was really trying to be Christian. I had every intention of being like Christ. I went there and I was saying, I've got the victory. I've got the victory. I got, I was singing. I was so, boy, I was so mad. I was so angry. I was so frustrated. I wanted to, I was upset. I was not, I, I wasn't thinking like Christ. And I said, oh, I'm old, huh? He said, I'm old, huh? Old, huh? So I wanted to do that Clint Eastwood look on him. <laughs> I said, old, huh? He said, Yo, come on, pastor. Come on, man. Admit it. Come on. Won't you just admit it? You old. I said, okay. I said, all right. Well, look, um, let's warm up a little bit. And we'll, um, so you see, when you get a little bit older, you get a little bit wiser. You know what I'm saying? You don't, you don't show your hand. You just, oh, okay. All right. So I said, okay, so here's what we're going to do. I said, um, since I'm older and, you know, you're in better shape and, you're, you know, you're faster and all of this other stuff. I said, let's do this. Let's warm up on the bike for a few minutes and um, so that we don't pull anything so somebody gets hurt. He said, oh, see, Pastor, I don't even need that. Old people need that. See, old people need to warm up. I said, idiot, don't you know that pro athletes warm up? I said, pro athletes warm up, idiot. Athletes who live their lives, this is how they make their living. You know, you know, soccer players warm up, they stretch, they do the calisthenics, and that's how they make their living. You know, and, and so he, he said, oh, okay, well, anyway, whatever, old man, okay, whatever, old man. Now, he's about 17 years old, and I'm telling y'all, he's talking much trash. We need a dump truck to pick it up. That's how much he's talking, all right? That's how much he's talking. 
I said, listen, okay. So I warm up. We go to the track. I said, okay. I said, what do you want to do? He, he said, well, let's see who can run around the building the fastest. I said, okay, we can do that. I said, but let's do this. Let's see who can run around the building the fastest and run around the building the fastest for the longest time. He said, what you mean? I said, well, okay, let's make it simpler. Let me, let me, let me speak your language for you. Let me tell you what I'm trying. To. Okay. I said, <laughs> I promised my wife I'd be good. Okay. I, 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 I said, I, you see, my wife is here, so I'm, I'm okay. Anyway, I got to be good. Um, he, I said, okay, let's see who can run a mile the fastest. A mile. Man, Pastor, oh, you shouldn't have asked me to do that. Pastor Pollard, you, man, oh, man, oh, man, don't you know I'm going to smoke you? I said, what you mean? He said, I said, man, you are? He said, what you mean? Now, all the inside, I'm like, oh, I'm going to kill him. Inside, I'm like, I'm going to kill him. So anyway, so inside, I'm saying on the inside, but on the outside, I'm cool. On the outside, he ain't seeing me sweat. I'm like, oh, okay, so, so what you mean? He said, Pastor, man, don't you know I run my mile in five minutes and 40 seconds? I said, Woo! I said, you lying, you lying Gentile. You don't run no mile in five minutes and 40 seconds. You know good and well you can't run no mile in five minutes. You know good and well. But you know what a five minute, but I'm saying to myself, you see how dumb you, he, he don't understand. Five minute mile, you have to be in great physical condition to do, okay, anyway, so anyway. I said, okay, well, whatever. I said, I'll try to keep up with you. Just don't hurt the old man, all right? Just don't hurt the old man. So you see, he, 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 he breaks out. We start running. I said, okay, ready, set, go. Beep. We hit the watch. So we're running. And he takes off, y'all. He's running fast. <sighs> he's going, and, and he's running. And so I'm, I'm right with him. He don't know, but I'm, I'm right on his heels. And then he looked back. Oh, all right. <sighs> So he, he looked back, and so, so we go around the track four times, and old Pastor P is right behind him, just right behind him. Just let him run, letting him run fast as he want to run. Pastor P just running behind him. So we come up on the fifth lap. Pastor, my asthma! Oh, Pastor, I, Pastor, my asthma! My asthma! I'm sorry. All of the Christian in me went out the door. I got up in his ear and I said, your asthma? I said, you got asthma, little girl? I said, you girly mind you. I started calling him names. I said, you sissy mind you, you got asthma? And so I said, I said, come on, man. Come on. I don't want to hear no asthma. So I grabbed his hand. And I said, let me show you what you don't know. So I grabbed his hand and I began to pull him around the gym. And I said, I said, oh, 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 oh. I said, what you about to hear? Asthma, 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 asthma. I said, asthma, huh? So we came around the, to, the, to the end of the fifth lap. And, and I let him sit on the side and I kept running. I'm putting, I'm, 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 I'm gonna make him never forget this experience. See, I told you the Christ, the Christ in me just, the Jesus in me. Oh, well, anyway, we're we gonna do that later. It was, it wasn't there. It wasn't there, Sam. It wasn't there. The Jesus in me wasn't there. It was the Ronald in me, all right? It was, it was the Ronald in me. And every time I ran by, you know, while he was sitting on the side, he was sitting on the side like this. He was sitting like this. And so every time I ran around him, I ran around him and I was like this. You all right? God loves you. The Lord loves you very much. Then I got holy again, all right? I went around, it was nine times to complete a mile around this gym, this indoor gym called Bally's back home. And so when I came around again, I finished my mile in about, oh, six minutes and like 35 seconds or something like that, right? And he said to me, uh, uh, Pastor, I need to talk to you about something. 
I said, okay, what you want to talk about? He said, you wasn't a Christian. <laughs> ah, I said, tell me, neither were you. I said, but did I make my point? Did I make my point? He said, I said, so, 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 so there are times in us when we become less than what we ought to be. Come on, play for me, Richard. When we become less than what we ought to be, when we don't fulfill what we ought to fulfill, when we don't do what we ought to do, there are times, and I'm not here to try to tell you that everything has been successful. That's not the issue. That's not true. And none of us in here can claim that to be true. I don't care if it was five years ago the last time you committed a sin. Or excuse me, the last time you realized you committed a sin. But you got to understand something. That same young man who was talking all of that smack about how I'm an old man and he can run and he can outrun this and outrun that. That same young man was having all other kind of problems in his life. He was having all kind of other issues in his life. And I didn't realize it until afterwards. And he didn't know how to come forward and say to me, I really need help, Pastor Paul. And I really, I'm really struggling with some things. And I'm really hurting about some things. And I'm really unsure about where I'm going to go. And I'm uncertain about what's going to happen with me. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure of what's going to take place. I'm not sure of where I'm going to go or what God's going to... He, he, he didn't have it within him. He didn't know that he could honestly come to somebody and say, it's okay, man. It's really okay. Bro, you ain't going to make a living. You ain't going to make no living being a track star. That's very obvious. But what you can do is you can, you can have eternal life if you come clean with God. You see, when, when I say to you, that between Acts 15 and 2 Timothy 4, Paul and John Mark somehow got it together. I want to also say to you that there was room for recovery and there's room for recovery only when we become real and we come clean. You got to come clean with God. Not because he doesn't know. He knows. He knows the hair on your head, the cattle upon a thousand hill of his. Remember, he's omniscient. He knows. But the real issue is that you have got to come clean with God for your sake. You see, you're lying to yourself if you think that somebody else other than God can make you happy. I don't care how many times I've said it all over the world. Don't marry somebody else to think that they can be your savior. There's only one savior and that's Jesus Christ the righteous. Don't get married thinking that this person's going to make me love the Lord anymore. Oh, you may have some, some type of, of, of infusion of, of energy for a moment. And God may lead and use somebody to lead you to him. But remember, Jesus is the goal. It is better for you to be alone and happy in Christ than to be married and miserable in marriage. Oh, y'all say amen. Y'all, y'all, y'all. See, y'all like to play. Y'all like to play here in New Zealand, huh? Y'all like to act like there's no marital problems here in New Zealand. You act, oh, is, is there divorce here in New Zealand? Uh-huh. Shirley Caesar, that gospel singer said, and this applies to coming clean, to be, you coming clean with God. She says, why in the world would I live in hell and then die only to go to hell again? Why in the world would you live in hell? Now, I know her theology is off, but the point is, why would you live a miserable life? When you can come clean with God and have life more abundantly. Why would you live a life in hell? And let me tell you what hell is, young people. 
Hell is coming to church and going to the clubs at night. Hell is coming to church after you just got in from the clubs. Hell is saying yes to the Lord or acting like you're saying yes to the Lord, but you're really saying yes to somebody else and giving them permission to do whatever they want to with your body. Hell is acting the part, but not really loving the Lord. That's hell. Hell is thinking as if you love Jesus. Pretending that you love the Lord. But you really don't love him and you really don't care to love him. Hell is following your mama and daddy's rules without a relationship with Christ. That's hell. Hell is being in a home where there is no joy, there is no peace, there is no hope, there is no love. That's hell. Living in hell is not coming clean with God because you're not coming clean with yourself. That's hell. God didn't choose you so that you could go to hell. He chose you so that you could spend eternity with him in heaven. That's why he chose you. Now, Paul had to come clean. I'm about to close here. I'm about to close. Paul had to come clean. That young man running around that track finally had to come clean. And let me tell you, it is better for you to come clean up front than to be found out. And then you have to come clean. Are y'all with me? It is better for you to tell it up front than to be found out later. You see, my mama knew that I had stolen her money. She knew that I had taken $40 out of her pocketbook. But she was just waiting on me to come clean. She waited about a week, a week, seven whole days, 24 hours, seven 24 hour periods, and waited for me to come clean. I had stolen about $40 out of her purse because I wanted to do what I wanted to do, and I didn't have any money, and I didn't want to tell her. And, and at the same time, I'm thinking, oh, she got so much money, she don't keep up with her money. So this was on a Saturday night. So she waited Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, all the way again till Saturday night again. Let me go through church. Came home. She said, son, she said, come here. I want to talk to you. See, I'm thinking that I'm smarter than my mama because she's working two jobs. She's working 16 hours a day. So she has all that money. Plus she's tired. So she ain't keeping up with her money. She don't know. It ain't nothing but $40 anyway. You know, I need it. I'm going to go out with my friends and go do what I'm going to do. And then I'll be back and mama be cool. So on Saturday night, she came, she came to the room and, and, and she said, come here. So I went to her room. I said, hey, mama, what's up, mama? She said, boy, did you enjoy singing in the choir today? I said, yeah, that was good. I said, boy, the choir, we rocked, didn't we? I said, mama, we sang that song, didn't we? She said, oh, yeah, y'all sounded beautiful. She said, but you know one thing I couldn't stand? I said, what's that? She said, I couldn't stand the hypocrites that are in that choir. I said, I went, huh? Hypocrites? I said, who? Who? Who, mama? Who a hypocrite, mama? Who's a hypocrite? She said, son, you. I said, Psh, mama, you, man, see, you tripping. Mama, stop it. What you mean I'm a hypocrite? She said, I waited for you to tell me you stole $40 out of my purse. I said, oh, that's what you're talking about. She said, let me tell you something. And she said, I was waiting for you to come clean. I said, why? I said, mama, I was scared. I was embarrassed. She said, well, I know. She said, because actually, Ronald, I had $100 I wanted to give you. You stole 40, but I actually had 100 that I was planning on giving you so you could have it 
and go out and do some things with your friends and go buy yourself some shoes and some stuff and some different things. This is as a, this is as a younger person. I learned from that, you all. I learned, and she, hold on, she told me, she said, now, you stole from me. She said, so now I want you to know that that $40, not only is that all you're going to get, you're going to have punishment, you're going to be on, you're going to have restrictions for the next month. I said, okay. She said, oh, oh, let me add one other thing. I said, what's that, mama? I said, I'm sorry. I, mama, I'm so sorry. I, don't, I won't do it again. I'm so sorry. Now, I was not a grown man. I was a teenager, right? She said, I want you to know something. You really cheated yourself. All that I wanted to give you, I can't give you now. Because I can't trust you. You haven't proven yourself to be trustworthy. All you had to do to be trustworthy was to come clean with me and tell me what was going on. Let me know what was happening with you. That's all you had to do. But you cheated yourself. Under this tent tonight, there's some young people, there's some young adults, there's some married couples, there's some singles, there's some people out there who are cheating themselves. And you're cheating yourself because you're not coming clean. You're not being clean with God. You're not coming clean for yourself. He already knows, but you got to come clean. And all he is doing is waiting on you to come clean. He's waiting on you to come forward. He's waiting on you to realize that he already knows, but... The change comes when you fess up. 1 John 1 tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I don't know what you came to do. Heads are bowed, your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Some of y'all came because you, you came for all kinds of reasons, whatever your reason. But it's time for you to come clean with God. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You want to come clean with God. God has not given up on you. You're afraid. You may be afraid that like Paul did to John Mark, that God has given up on you. God already knows your problem. He already knows where you're hurting. He already knows where you're lying. He already knows where you're cheating. He already knows that. Why don't you come clean with God and stop cheating yourself this morning? He won't give up on you. Paul gave up on John Mark too soon. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. You're not talking to your friends. You're talking to God right now. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. You want to come clean with God? I just want you to raise your hand. You want to come clean with God? Just raise your hand where you are. There's something you're dealing with in your life. There's something that you're struggling with and you're afraid to come clean because you think God is going to give up on you. Well, he won't give up on you. Hold your hand up. Keep him up. Keep him up. Keep him up. God sees you, brother. God sees you, my sister. God sees you. Hold your hand up high. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, but you're coming clean with God. You're saying, Lord, I'm coming clean with you. I'm struggling with some things. There's some stuff in my life. Lord, I'm coming clean with you because, Lord, it's not worth it to lie to myself and it's not worth it to lie to you. Come clean with God right now. He won't give up on you. In the back, back there. I want y'all to stop moving out there. Stop moving. Please stop moving. This is a sacred time. Stop the, all of the frivolous talk. None of the wasted discussion. I want to come clean with you, God. There's a problem I need victory over. There's something that I like doing that I need to come clean. I need, I need to, I need, I need to come clean. I, I just gotta come clean. I can't be politically correct. I don't have time for that. I don't have time to, to, time to play games. God, right now my life is at stake and my health is at stake and I need to come clean. I want you to raise your hands. You're in the back. You're in the back. God sees you. God sees you. God sees you. Come on, just stand where you are. Now that you're raising your hands, stand. Just stand. Only if you want to come clean with God. Stand where you are. Stand where you are. Only if you want to come clean with God. He has not given up on you. Stand where you are. Stand. All over this place, he sees you standing. The appeal this morning, the appeal today, is that you want to come clean with God. Come clean with God. See, John Mark 
knew what it was like to be given up on. I'm so glad that God, he arrests our attention. Sometimes God has to handcuff us. He has to incarcerate us. He has to allow us to be hospitalized so that he can gain our attention. But he wants you to come clean with him. Lord, I really don't love the church. I'm really struggling with loving this thing. I don't understand these people. They're getting on my last nerve. But God, I need to come clean with you because after all, they're not the issue. I'm the issue. Now, those of you who are standing, I just want you to make your way down. Come on forward. Those of you who are standing, if you feel God, you feel the need to come forward, I want you to join those who are coming down at this time. See, men and women, boys and girls are making their decision for Jesus. They're coming forward. See, you can be a Seventh-day Adventist and still be lost. Just because you're an Adventist doesn't mean that you're saved. Just because you come to church on Saturday does not mean that you're in right relationship with God. You need to come clean with God. Come on forward. Come on down front. Meet me down front here, front and center. Front and center. Meet me down front. Bless his name. Come on down front. Come on, squeeze in up front. Come on up front. Come on in. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, y'all. You're coming clean with God. Come clean with God about the anger you have towards your mama. Come clean with God about the frustration you're feeling towards your father, your daddy. Come clean, fathers. You're out there. Mamas, you're out there. You need to come clean. He won't give up on you. He has not given up on you. He sent me here this week to let you know that it's okay. You, you know, he won't give up on you. Yeah, I may have broken the law of God, but that's why he sent Jesus. I may have broken one of the Ten Commandments, uh, uh, but the law, don't you know, the Romans 10, 4 says that Christ is the end of the law. The law only leads us to Jesus, who is the solution. The law is not the solution. The law is the mirror. Jesus is the solution. Now, those of you who are out there, there's somebody you've given up on. But you want to renew your life and your, your purpose, your, your mind to praying for that person. There's somebody you wrote off, but now you want to pray for them. You want to put them back on your prayer list. And you want to pray for them. I want you to stand where you are. Somebody that you stopped praying for because you were so angry with them. Somebody you stopped praying for because you were so frustrated. You gave up on them, but you want to realize, you're realizing right now, if God didn't give up on you, I can't give up on nobody else. I want you to stand. You want to reignite your prayer life. You want to start praying for these people again. I want you to stand. God sees you. Praise his name. Are there anybody, there's anybody else. I want to pray for these people again. Oh, they may have disappointed you, but you want to pray again. You want to give, you want to get back in there and pray for people. You want to intercede. This morning, my wife and I were reading uh, uh, where, from the manuscripts of Ellen White where she was saying that God, that Jesus intercedes for us. That means he's praying for us when we're not praying for ourselves. See, when you fall in love with Jesus, you're praying for somebody else. Come on, stand, young people. There's somebody you need to pray for, young lady. The young man that lied to you, he betrayed you, you need to pray for him. The young lady, the young man who gave up your secrets, you need to pray for them. I want you to stand where you are. Won't you stand? Come on, is there any place you'd rather be than being with Jesus? Come on, let's sing this song. Falling in love with Jesus.